Hello and welcome to the first of our new series of events called Look Who's Speaking. We organize this series of talks on different issues once a month to provide clarity on the different issues on kidney disease and organ donation and other diseases. My name is Hilaria and I am the founder and chair of a small charity called Wish BME Kidney Network. We are based in Manchester, UK, and we provide advice, support, and advocacy and education to kidney disease and transplant patients and their families who find it difficult navigating government systems and institutions. We also campaign and raise awareness about organ donation. So moving on, we would like to keep here. We would like to welcome on our platform, Steve Belcher. Steve is a former dialysis nurse clinician with 33 years experience. That's amazing, really. And uh, he is a founder and executive director of Urban Kidney Alliance, a US nonprofit organization. He currently holds two master de master's degrees, just like me, <laughs> a master of That's nursing it. with specialization in leadership and management and um, an MSc in health education and promotion, both from Walden University. He's, he also holds a postmaster certificate in nonprofit management. Still, we'll talk about understanding dialysis for newly diagnosed patients today. Um, I will not spoil it for you because I've seen the material, but I hope that by the end of the session, it will allay some anxieties people might have. Before I hand over to Steve, I would like to go over the housekeeping for this event. This session will run for approximately one hour. Steve will speak for 20, 20 minutes with perhaps five minutes peel over. Then there will be a question and answer session. If you have questions in the meantime, put them in the chat box on your right and we will answer them at the end or Steve can take them whilst he's speaking. If you would like to come on to ask a question, either raise your hand or post in the chat and I will bring you on. So thank you for listening to me. I will hand over to Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for giving us your time today. Okay, everybody, enjoy. Steve? Uh, uh, thank you, Hilaria, for... I'd like to thank Hilaria and the WISH and BME Kidney Network for inviting me to do this uh, important topic uh, on dialysis, understanding dialysis for new kidney patients. And i also like to say good morning or good afternoon to the people watching wherever you may be. Me, myself, I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, doing this broadcast, so um, welcome. So let me get to my screen and start with the presentation. All right. So today, I want to be talking about, again, understanding dialysis for new kidney patients, what you should know. Now, as Hilaria said, I am uh, executive director of Urban Kidney Alliance, but we go by also Urban Health Alliance, which we are 501c3 nonprofit, uh, small nonprofit, I may say that advocates for health education, uh, chronic illnesses, uh, just education that deals with chronic diseases that affect minority populations uh, as a whole. So with that being said, we also do PSAs, um, education and, and we have material i'm about to play one of the psas that we um presented here we go um we can't hear the sound steve do you have your sound on at all Yes. Okay. Uh, but, but we can't hear it. Okay. So uh, this particular ad, I apologize if you can't hear the sound. Uh, I don't have the sound off, but this particular PSA is advocating on 
hypertension and diabetes, which are the two leading causes of, of kidney failure. And what we try to do with these small PSAs, it's about two minutes, is disseminate uh, this material across social media so people could be aware of kidney disease awareness. So let me move on. So this is a tale of two countries with similar statistics. As I said, diabetes and hypertension are the two leading causes of kidney disease in the United States and the United Kingdom. In fact, uh, we are more similar uh, than not similar when it comes to this disease. Uh, the UK population as of June 2021 was 68 million. Uh, US is 332 million. And if you look at the amount of people affected by kidney disease, it almost mirror each other. It's just that the United States has a larger population. Here in the United States, approximately 37 million people have kidney disease. In the UK, approximately 3 million. Uh, deals with kidney disease. So let's start uh, talking about the start of kidney dialysis. If you're watching this and if you've been newly diagnosed or you may find yourself on your way to dialysis, uh, I'm going to start with the process. Now, let me just say this. With the United States and United Kingdom, the process could be different. This process that I'm talking about is based off of the US. However, anywhere I would imagine that you start in the world where you start dialysis, I'm sure there's a intake process or a mission process where you fill out papers and they tell you what's going to happen and the uh, advantages and disadvantage and the complications that could occur uh, with dialysis. But here in the United States, normally this is how the process uh, starts. Now, this is not a all in all how it, how it goes. It can be different ways, but this is normally the, the process. Patient is diagnosed with kidney disease i.e. they may be had kidney disease long term meaning they went through the stage at the five stages and now they're finally here it could be acute whether you took some dye for mri or something caused your kidneys to shut down whether it was a drug overdose or anything that shocked the kidneys that caused the kidneys to temporarily stop working for a period of time it's what's called acute uh, kidney disease or by another health condition, lupus, diabetes, uh, polycystic, anything else that causes this condition to get to uh, the end stage uh, ending is when you start dialysis. So then most patients are recommended to an outpatient dialysis facility. You may not have started dialysis. It could be, you could be at stage four, stage five, still going to your nephrologist. And he may say it's time you start that way. A lot of people start from the hospital. They get sick, they go to the emergency room, and then they find out that they got kidney failure. And then they got to start dialysis right away. But then once they're in a the hospital, they start off, they, they get recommend it pretty much to a outpatient facility. Some doctors may inform their patients about other modalities, which should happen. But here in the United States, a majority of time, patients are diagnosed and they are recommended to an outpatient hemodialysis facility that that nephrologist may be associated with. Uh, many patients are not aware of other treatment modalities until after the start of outpatient hemodialysis. Throughout my experience working in dialysis, I've seen this many times where patients 
I would come across patients who look well to, to be qualified to do dialysis at home or another modality, okay, but they didn't know about it. You're asking the question, do you know about peritoneal dialysis or home dialysis? You'll be a good candidate. No, no one never told me. Or someone told them they got misinformation and based on that misinformation, they decided not to do it. So let's take, for instance, someone did um, peritoneal dialysis and they had a bad uh, experience with it. They may say something to a newly diagnosed patient about their experience and based off of that, they may not even do it because it's like, well, if it happened to you, that can happen to me. I've seen that many times and that's where we had to go in and educate and dispel the myths that no, everyone is different. Your experience may be different than my experience. So if you're newly diagnosed, you can't always go by someone else's experience. So let's talk about the treatment options for kidney failure. The first one, hemodialysis. Hemodialysis uses a vascular access in your body to connect you to the dialysis machine. Your blood, which is about two cups at a time, cycles through the dialysis machine, which filters out the waste and extra fluid before returning it to your body. Now, there are two types of access. All right, you got your catheter, all right, and then you got your fistula or your graft. Arterial venous fistula, which uses your own veins, or your arterial venous graft, which uh, is a plastic flimsy tube and uh, Gore-Tex material that's implanted under your skin and connected to your veins. Now let's look at the process of hemodialysis. And this, why if you're on dialysis now, while you're on the machine, this is the process that's actually happening to clean your blood. So if we look at the gentleman's arm where the needles are at uh, bottom right, you can see that you have line, line from artery to apparatus. Basically that's uh, the arterial needle connected to the arterial line, which pulls the blood out through the pump, it pumps the blood out, and it goes through uh, the filter where you see where it says tube in selectively uh, permeable membrane. That's the artificial kidney, and that's where pretty much the magic is happening. Then you have your, your bath or your solution that uh, has your dialysate that comes in and, and cleans your blood, and then the waste and the used dialysate, as you can see, where it says dialys dialysine solution goes out to the drain. And in this case, it's to that uh, bag to your bottom right. So this is actually happening. If you see at the top where it has semi-permeable membrane, you have your blood with waste product on one side of the uh, uh, filter or membrane, then you got your dialysate, and then you got your osmosis and diffusion to your right where the waste products passes through the membrane, and it kind of like equalize out, and the um, the old or the urea and the waste is discarded into the drain and out the door. <laughs> Let me move on. So, Again, treatment options for kidney failure. You got your in center hemodialysis, and then you got your home dialysis to your right, where you're in the privacy of your own home. Uh, I know in the UK they they have it, and here as well in the United States. I'm not sure in the UK if you can do it by yourself or you need to have a partner here in the US the government or Medicare has allowed uh, for solo home dialysis. 
However, it's probably best to have someone there with you if you're not really um, sure of yourself or have that aptitude to do this on your own. And if you're uh, medically fragile, you definitely want someone there with you just in case something was to happen on the machine and you couldn't do the interventions yourself. So we move on. There's peritoneal dialysis. That's another uh, treatment option. As you can see here, uh, you have a tube, uh, which is called a PD catheter that's inserted into your abdomen and they use the peritoneum line of your stomach as the filter. So instead of using a dialysis machine, peritoneal uses the lining of your abdomen called the peritoneum as a natural filter to remove toxin and extra fluids from your blood. It uses a special cleansing fluid called dialysate now, this dialysate is a little different than the regular dialysate they use for hemodialysis. The dialysate that they use for uh, peritoneal dialysis has a lot of dextrose in it, uh, which kind of help uh, pour those molecules or the waste across that um, membrane. And so they have different... Um, solutions for peritoneal dialysis. So uh, one may be a little stronger than the other because you got different strengths that pull uh, the, the waste. So uh, someone may, may use a higher concentration of dialysate and it may not sit with them where they may have to use a, a lower concentrate. Uh, peritoneal dialysis can be completed by yourself without any needles. And there are two types. You got CAPD and you got CCPD. Now CAPD stands for Continuous Ambulatory Peritoneal Dialysis, where when you see to the um, illustration to the right, you would have someone doing it manually where you have these bags hanging up on a pole and the you're doing it manually. You let the fluid infuse in your abdomen, and it sits there for a while, and then you're draining it out by gravity with that bag. And then you got CCPD, which stands for continuous psychoperitoneal dialysis, which uses a cycler, which you will see on the next slide. Uh, this is the peritoneal cycler for CCPD to the right, where you could be in bed at night or wherever, and this machine does everything for you while you're sleeping. Now, another treatment option is a kidney transplant, which that's what most people are aiming for, okay? Many people decide to pursue a kidney transplant as a treatment option. A transplant is where a healthy kidney is placed inside your body to help you regain some of your normal kidney function. Kidney transplants take time. Normally, dialysis is needed while you wait for a kidney to become available. Now, let me be clear with kidney transplant. Kidney transplant is not a cure. It's a treatment option. So if someone decided not to seek that option and they were comfortable with dialysis, that's that person. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that because that's a different treatment option. Some people can't qualify for a kidney transplant because they have other medical issues going on. You got to go through a strenuous uh, evaluation to, to get this transplant. You know, if one has a lot of weight, you may have to lose weight to get on the list. So someone may not decide to take this treatment option. If, if they do that, that's okay. Again, it's a different treatment option. I've seen patients who are, who are 
very comfortable on dialysis. They may do home dialysis, maybe six to eight hour treatment, um, three days a week. Let's say if you did treatment four days a week at home at six hours per treatment or seven hours, and you did it four days a week, that's 28 hours of treatment opposed to someone um, at in-center dialysis doing four hours, three days a week. Now, that's only 12 hours of treatment opposed to 28 hours of treatment. So you can clearly see the difference of what the clearance is going to be. And in fact, I've seen people who've done home dialysis have GFR or kidney, you know, their clearances better than someone with a transplant. So you have to know your own body, what what's right for you and what's best for you, what treatment option is best for you. Again, this is a treatment option, just like the next one I'm going to talk about, which is conservative therapy. Okay. Some people decide with their doctor's help and with, with uh, discussing this with their family, if they have family, that dialysis isn't the right choice for them. And if they do that, that's okay. Certain activities can comfortably extend life. If you need dialysis and choose not to receive treatment, we know survival is not likely. Now, how long that will be, who knows? Some people, uh, excuse me. I apologize. Uh, some people decide not to uh, go on dialysis, okay? Because they may feel it's too much. Some people start dialysis and they may be on for several years and they feel like they can't go on any longer. I've seen that. Or some people may have other things going on like cancer, uh, you know, liver uh, failure disease, other things that may cause them pain, okay? And they may not can't bear it. And they just may decide that this is too much. So again, conservative therapy is another treatment option one can do. You don't often hear about this, okay? But here in the United States, that option is available. Now let's keep in mind, your choice doesn't have to be permanent. If one decides to stop dialysis and then it becomes too much, where they can't deal with the symptoms from that, then they have to, you know, and they decide to go back on dialysis, then they do that, excuse me. They may decide to go back on and they do that. Um, if your lifestyle uh, or health changes in the future, you always had an option to change the way you receive treatment. Let me move on. So let's talk about the dialysis team and outpatient hemodialysis. You have the nephrologist or the kidney doctor. You have a nurse practitioner. You have an administrator. You have a charged nurse, and then you have your nursing staff, technician, or, or the nurse that does um, the patient's treatment. Then you have your biomedical technician, you have your dietitian, and you have your social worker. And in the UK, I know they have psychologists, which something they don't have here in the US, which 
I really feel like they should have psychologists uh, as well as social workers, because some social workers can't always um, deal with the situation that a patient may be facing, such as a uh, psychologist could. Now, the biomedical technician, that gentleman fixes the machine. You may not see him. You may uh, you may see a guy come in and working on a, a machine that's nobody's on, fixing it, calibrating it, or setting it up for preventive maintenance. That's what these gentlemen do. Outpatient hemodialysis, what to expect. Normally, again, I don't know about the UK and their process, but normally here in the US on the first day of outpatient treatment, you're normally taking care of paperwork, i.e. the consent form, patients' rights and responsibilities, uh, the AOB form, which is assignment of benefits for your labs when they do the monthly labs and the yearly labs or uh, labs they may need to get right away. They could bill your insurance for that. The grievance procedure, patient's grievance procedure, uh, the procedure if, if you got something goes wrong that you don't like or you want to uh, complain about or something's going on in the facility that you don't agree about, there's a certain process, grievance process here in the United States that you have to follow. Uh, then you got your ownership, uh, advanced director's form, and any other forms they want you to sign. Normally, you'll possibly meet the staff if they're there, the dietitian, the social worker, psychologist, um, PCT, which stands for patient care technician, or the charge nurse. So once you get your uh, fill out the paperwork and, and go through that process, they normally take you, you get your weight. Some places here in the US, they have sinks for patients to wash their access. If you have an AV fistula or AV graft, get that done. Then the technician or the nurse who normally has you will come and get you from the waiting room or the, or the, the nurse who did the intake or whoever did the intake will let you know this person's ready. They'll come and get it, get the weight, wash the access. Then they take you back to your chair. Normally what happens at that point, they're obtaining your vital signs at the chair side, your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature, and they already have your weight. Outpatient hemodiasis, what to expect, continue. So, Normally, while you're there, after they get your uh, vitals, prep your arm or your catheter, then they start treatment. Okay. Now, treatment is normally anywhere from three to five hours. Some places vary. I know the UK, I believe, maybe standard treatment could be five hours. Please don't quote me on that. But, but here in the US, time generally goes from three to five hours. Um, Vital signs are usually monitored every 30 minutes to, to one hour, depending on where you're at. And when they monitor your vital signs, normally they come into your chair just like right here, and they're asking if, if you're if you're awake, they ask you if you're okay. A lot of times when the patient has their eyes closed, we're supposed to tap them and ask them, are they okay? They're supposed to open their eyes because if somebody has their eyes closed, and you may think they're asleep, it could be actually either passed out. So you, you, you have to kind of tap their leg or touch their arm, try not to startle them um, out of their sleep and see if they're okay. Uh, then we um, document their blood pressure, their pulse, how much fluid they remove, their venous pressure, their arterial pressure, the blood flow rate, everything on the screen that we're supposed to document, and then we write a short note, patient's eyes closed, uh, or patient sleeping, patient watching television, patient on, um, on the telephone, patient uh, stable, just watching or looking around the unit. And uh, also, 
patients during hemodialysis, patients usually sleep, read, watch TV, surf the internet, talk on the phone, play games on their phone or tablet, word games and books or magazines, or talk with their chair side neighbor, the person that's sitting next to them. Uh, some patients just sit and watch the staff work or whatever, you know, or whatever they're doing. Uh, before COVID-19, some clinics allow patients to have their loved one uh, sit at the chair side with them. So now with COVID, COVID and everything, uh, most the caregivers or family members have to wait in a, a lobby, patient lobby, or sit in the car. All right. So let's talk about some complications that can happen during hemodialysis. Let's talk about hypotension or low blood pressure. Mostly comes from pulling too much fluid off and the symptoms normally nausea or vomiting, dizziness, fainting, yawning, sweating, feeling hot or ringing in your ears. Um, some patients we recommend that they may be on hypertension or high blood pressure medication not to take your medicine before on the day of dialysis. If you take medicine in the morning, if you go to dialysis in the morning, you want to normally, I'm not telling people to do that. You have to consult with your nephrologist, but normally here in the U.S., uh, the nephrologist normally have patients who are taking multiple blood pressure medications on the day of dialysis to, to hold them until after dialysis, because if you take them before dialysis and you have a lot of fluid on, it's like a double whammy. The the press, the medication is going to lower your pressure and us trying to pull off the fluid is going to bring your pressure down. And in general, that's a bad mixture. And more than likely, we're not going to be able to take all that fluid off. In fact, we're going to probably be putting more fluid back on because we got to treat the hypotension. Uh, muscle cramps. That's a big one. And that comes from pulling too much fluid. And to prevent that, one, you got to watch your fluid intake. Uh, here in the U.S., the recommendation is 32 ounces per day or one to three liters between treatments. If you go over that, some patients are likely to uh, suffer some consequences because of that, okay? Uh, access problem, okay? That during dialysis, you could talk, uh, you're talking about clotting or prolonged bleeding after treatment or infection. That could come from your access. A lot of patients don't know about that. That's why we always encourage to clean your access if you have a fistula or graft every day with an antimicrobial soap, okay? Also, if you got a catheter, try to keep that dressing on. Try to keep it clean and dry, not get it wet. And if you're able to get extra um, dressing, if that dressing happens to come off during the summer, if it's sweating or whatever, know the directions how to replace that dressing, okay? And another complication is fever or chills, which can come from power gen or bloodstream infection. Now, you got to remember, when you're on dialysis, it's a lot of water, you know, being used, okay, to help clean your blood. Now, you can get all types of bacteria that comes from this water. That's why they have what's called a reverse osmosis machine. Uh, they have carbon tanks, um, um, softeners, and all type of equipment in the back that make this water pure as possible. However, sometimes uh, you do get bugs in the water and it can cause an infection. That's why uh, the biomed guy takes water samples each month, I believe, or every quarter to check to see what the colony count is or the bacteria uh, count in the water. They send out samples. So 
these are the things that could happen. Some patients may have are who are on dialysis now who may be watching this may have experienced hypotension and know some of these symptoms or experience it or muscle cramping or access problems and even fever or chills and just don't and doesn't have to come from uh the water it can come from if you have an infection or uh, i mean i'm sorry if you have an, a, a catheter or your access if people uh, the technician or the nurse sticking in the same area or they're not cleaning your access properly the germs on your skin can get into your bloodstream through that opening where the needle goes in. So you have to be very vigilant and careful uh, if you're on dialysis when it comes to keeping your access uh, properly cleaned and maintained. Outpatient dialysis, post dialysis treatment. So once treatment is finished, Okay, your three hours, four, how many hours you've done. What's hap what happens now is the blood pump speed is lowered to 200. And we're reinfusing or giving you your blood back with saline. Okay. Now, once your blood is returned, we normally get a pressure to see what your blood pressure is ask you how you're feeling. Then what we do is pull the needles out one at a time, or some patients ask you to pull both needles and they'll hold both of them at the same time um, so they can hurry up and get out of there. Once bleeding stops, we're taking vital signs, okay? Sitting and standing, we're taking your temp and we're taking your pulse rate. Then, uh, patients normally obtain their weight and they leave the clinic or wait for transportation in the patient lobby. Let's talk about some important tips you should know as a patient or caregiver. Very important. Each day, check uh, your AV fistula or AV graph every day, morning and night, twice a day, for the brew it and the thrill. Uh, the thrill is you just feel where your access is and you feel that thrill. I'm sorry, the thrill is, is when you feel the access and you feel the movement through that. And the brew it is um, you, you're listening for a sound, a swooshing sound. And as you hit, see in this picture, as the person has the stethoscope on the access, they're listening for that brew it, that swishing sound that, that moves through there. Know your patient's rights and responsibilities. Normally, you go over this form during admission. A lot of patients, when they fill out these paperwork, they'll put it away and forget about it. But read your rights and responsibilities. Very important because a lot of patients, something may happen and when the clinic approach you about it or say something, you may say, oh, I didn't know about it. They may say, oh, that was in your rights and responsibilities. You should know. Patients have a right to change doctors. You have a right to go to a different clinic if you don't like it where you're at. Now, this is here in the US. I don't know how the UK works, but the, in the US, patients have a lot of rights. You have a right to know your, your uh, treatment plan. You have a right to uh, be involved in your care. If, if your kidney doctor says he wants you to do four hours, but you're on dialysis and your body starts cramping, you start getting sick at three and a half, you have a right to say, look, and if your clearances are still good at three and a half as, as they are at four, then you have a right to discuss that with your doctor say look I think I feel better my body is better at three and a half than four I don't want to do four some patients just leave it to the doctors whatever the doctors say and go about it even though they professionals but they don't they're not you your body knows you know your body more than anyone else okay now look the 
the practice of medicine uh, is the art of medicine is not an exact science. It's not. So whatever your doctor may say, he may say it, but that, that may not be the best thing for you. That's an opinion. So I say that to say, be involved in your care. And all this, if you're in the U.S., is, is outlined in your patient's rights and your responsibility. Uh, learn and understand the patient grievance policy. If it's something you don't like about your facility or what they're doing, or if they're doing something wrong, they're not washing their hands, they're not putting on gloves, um, they're not wearing their mask when they should be, when they're changing your catheter. Hey, say something. And what happens normally a lot of patients don't want to say anything because they feel that they're going to maybe be targeted or be treated a different way. And unfortunately, in some places, that do happen. That does happen, excuse me. So learn and understand your patient's grievance policy, okay? Also understand your lab values that you get each month or twice a month definitely should understand what they mean to you. And if your values are out of range, how can you get them back in range? Also, try to stay healthy best you can, okay? And follow your treatment regimen. If, if you're three and a half hours, stay three and a half hours. If you're three times a week, Come three times a week. If you got to miss a treatment, call and reschedule. But be intentional uh, with your treatment plan because that is really the best way to stay in front of this disease and, and, and stay as healthy as you can living with this and living a, a quality life in spite of this is to follow that treatment regimen and try to get the best treatment option that's gonna be right for you and get as much as you can out of that treatment option until you get your transplant, if you're on the transplant list, or if you're not, just incorporating that treatment option into your life and living your life uh, with that treatment option. You know, make that treatment option work around your life. You not work around the treatment option. Ask questions and advocate for your health. That's very important of asking questions. Uh, no uh, question is stupid or dumb to ask because that's how you're going to learn about your condition by asking questions. If you just go to dialysis, and you see stuff, people doing different things you don't understand, but you just don't understand what's going on. And, you know, you got something going on with you and, you know, you think it's part of the process, but it's not. And if you don't ask no questions, that whatever's going on, that small thing can turn into something big and it could be detrimental to your treatment okay so definitely ask questions and advocate for yourself so let's just talk about some statistics as i get ready to close this out um this is the united states very shocking very very shocking when it comes to kidney disease uh there are more than 7500 dialysis centers in the united states as of January 2020, uh, and that's growing. That's growing. It, it, it's, it's just unbelievable. The U.S. dialysis industry has a combined annual revenue of about $25 billion. Okay, that's billion. The global dialysis service market generates annual revenue of about $82 billion. Nearly 2 million people worldwide receive dialysis treatment. Asia has the most dialysis patients. 
Demand for kidney dialysis services is growing in emerging economies where access to care has been historically insufficient. All right, so we're starting to see like um, Nigeria, India, all these uh, places, Africa, uh, where you're starting to see clinics come up. However, these clinics are not given the best quality of care. I know places in East Africa, Nigeria, where patients only get two treatments a week or one treatment for four hours a week. It's unbelievable, okay? And diabetes and hypertension are the two leading causes of kidney failure in the United States. Now let's look at the UK. Kidney care in the UK. Around 3 million people in the UK has chronic kidney disease. I'm sure that's a lot of people. Approximately 63,000 people in the UK are being treated for kidney failure. Okay? That's a lot smaller than the United States, but still that's a lot of people affected. Uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension are the biggest causes of chronic kidney disease just like here in the United States. You have 40 to 45,000 premature deaths in the UK each year due to chronic kidney disease. I mean, any number is too much, okay? Blacks, Asians, and minority ethnic communities are five times more likely to develop CKD than other groups. That's just the facts. Uh, approximately 3,000 transplants take place every year in the UK. And I believe that's, let me hide this, let's close it. Uh, but five people are still waiting. Now, that's relatively small compared to almost 100,000 people in the US waiting for a transplant. Okay. 5,000, that's 95,000 people more so it's just horrendous so let's talk about steps for living a healthy life if uh you can do this even on dialysis but if if you got kidney disease stages one through four and even five if you're at well below five but you're just teetering because stage five is if you're below uh uh, I believe 15%. But see your physician for regular checkups. Ask what you can do to help keep your kidneys healthy. Definitely ask questions. A lot of people go to these appointments and just listen to the nephrologist and don't ask questions. Please, no question is a stupid question. Ask whatever questions you need to ask to make you feel comfortable with your condition. If your doctor prescribes your medicines, take as directed. To work right, many medicines need to be taken even when you feel fine. Exercise regularly with your doctor's uh, permission. Be active for 30 minutes a day, uh, at least five days a week, or 30 minutes a day for maybe three times a week or four times, whichever is comfortable for you. Eat a low fat and low salt diet. A healthy diet can prevent diabetes, high blood pressure and kidney disease. Avoid tobacco. Uh, that's you, you always hear that because of uh, the risk for heart disease uh, and other diseases from uh, tobacco use. Uh, get tested for kidney disease. Uh, kidney disease cannot always be prevented, okay? However, with testing, at least you know where you stand. And always treat kidney disease early if you had it. And what I mean by that, the doctor got you on medicine, make sure you take your blood pressure medicine. A lot of these medicines uh, do uh, a double impact. They control the pressure and protect the kidneys from protein from spilling. Um, so, so definitely 
take these medications when uh, when prescribed and also drink plenty of water. Now, I don't advise if you're on dialysis, that doesn't pertain to you because we know if you drink plenty of water, you're going to get into fluid overload. So you don't want that. I recommend staying within the recommended daily allowance, which is 32 ounces. Also, you can be creative and get ice cubes, freeze them, and maybe put your favorite drink in an ice tray, put it in the freezer, and uh, let it kind of semi-freeze, and you can use that to suck on them. However, don't forget to use that for your uh, uh, count into your 32-ounce fluid intake. And as we end, this is a notable quote about health from uh, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Of all of the forms of inequality, injustice and in health is the most shocking and humane. And I've seen that in dialysis, even over in some of these countries where patients only get one to two treatments a week, maybe every other week for four hours. Whereas here, in the UK or other uh, established countries, it's three days a week, three to four hours of treatment. And some patients abuse that right. Some patients don't show up for, I, I've seen it, for 30 days or for two weeks because they still have urinary output. And then you got some places where patients, they want the treatment, they need the treatment, but they only have a day or two day access to treatment because the facility doesn't have consumables. So there's definitely uh, inequality and injustice in health. And with that being said, I'd just like to thank you for uh, letting me share this PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna end it and come back on All right. I kind of went over the 20 minutes. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, you had so much uh, information to give, and I hope that, you know, the people who've come today have actually taken something away. I know that, you know, you are an expert in the U.S. I was hoping I could get um, um, somebody from the, the U.K., but um, they were unable to make it today because today is Sunday, obviously. And most of usually our... Um, our uh, events are held on Saturday. Now, um, there is a question in the chat from Mr. Crystal, Crystal Orbit. Um, are there alternatives to hemodialysis? Uh, yes, and that's uh, peritoneal dialysis. And we, we talked, I talked about that in the slide where the use of uh, a PD catheter is inserted in the abdomen and it sits there and they use the peritoneum, the lining of the stomach inside as the filter. And that's the other alternative. Uh, another one is transplant, all right, pre-exemptive. If somebody's in stage four, stage five, and they haven't started dialysis, here in the US, they got something called preemptive transplant where if they find a living donor uh, before they actually have kidney failure, yeah. then they can get, get a transplant, thus uh, bypassing dialysis. And then another treatment is no treatment at all, which is conservative ther therapy, which the doctor will do everything they can to manage your disease and the symptoms that are created from the disease and until either you can't, you know, until the symptoms get too much where you can't take it and you want to get treatment or you pass away from, a, you know, from a uh, condition from that maybe because you didn't have dialysis, your potassium may be high and you may have a heart attack. 
Yeah, um, we do have that in the in the UK as well. It's called it's a program called Transplant First, and usually once somebody's diagnosed with uh, kidney disease, the transplant team or the consultant, their consultant uh, consultants would offer them that option, and people are able to make the choice where they're going, whether it's hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or if they want to consider transplant, if somebody who is eligible is there to, to actually donate uh, a, a kidney to them. Now, the issue we have in the UK is that people do not donate. Um, people, especially from the black community, we don't donate. Um, we don't sign up to the organ donor register until we actually need it. And I was in that position. And that's why I've, I've dedicated my life to campaigning for organ donation and doing, you know, exactly this. Just like, you know, you have from your experience as, um, as, a, 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 with, as a, a kidney, a renal nurse a clinician who has seen people suffering. Um, Steve does, everybody listening, Steve does have... Um, a YouTube channel where he has a lot of information on there. Um, if you're interested, although it's more get towards uh, the US, but there's some information that you can actually use from there. He's also, he also um, wrote a book. Um, Steve, do you want to go very briefly about your book and show everybody? Sure, here's the book right here. Uh, How to Survive Outpatient Hemodialysis, A Guide for Patients with Kidney Failure. And the, Hilaria, the reason why I, I wrote this book, yeah. because again, just like you, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about this, seeing the injustices and seeing patients who start dialysis and, and not know uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. They, I, I've worked in a hospital where I started the patient's first treatment yeah. and they're bewildered. They don't know what's going on and everything is moving so fast and so what happens when that process takes place it's like bam 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 the doctor comes in they talk to them they get the treatment they're ready to get discharged next thing you know the case manager is in the room what their address so they can send them the outpatient dialysis yeah. so now uh patients about to enter a world their new normal that they have no knowledge about uh entering this uh entering in this new uh environment the dialysis unit so what this book does um uh, it, it 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 pretty much um prepares the patient for this journey into dialysis what to expect on the very first day uh what to expect uh throughout the treatment uh some of the uh uh, my table of contents or chapters, what is chronic kidney failure, introduction to hemodialysis, your first day of outpatient hemodialysis, uh, patient rights and responsibilities that I touched on in the PowerPoint, understanding patient grievance policy, treatment option, treatment options for kidney failure, kidney transplant, how to care for your access, making wise food, making wise food choices, additional important information, stay healthy. In my last chapter, uh, I talk about coronavirus and kidney disease, something that's very important uh, patients should know about dealing with this uh, disease. Yeah. Um, well, you see, in the in the UK, because I know you spoke earlier on about insurance for uh, uh, people um, in the UK, we have the NHS, the National Health Service. So we don't really pay for most of what we get. So people turn up, see their consultants and they're taking straight through. Uh, if they're going to go on dialysis and they pick the one they want to go on, they go for the operation. If it's peritoneal, they're given a date. If it's hemodialysis, they're given a date. There's a, there's a vein mapping, as it's called, that people have to go on and they you know check it and make sure they have good access. And then they're given a date for their, um, for their operation. Sometimes it's more, some of, most of the time it's a day case. Uh, some people who, are, who will be squirmish like me, um, I don't like needles or blood or the hospital. Um, some people go for a general an anesthetic. Um, I just have a few questions before we uh, close uh, um, this session. Um, 
if the catheter becomes wet, because you said something earlier on about cleaning the catheter, um, if it becomes wet, what can patients um, do in that case, um, especially concerning the fact that there's a, um, there is a risk of infection? So what can people do with the catheter? Because some people, new patients would not know what to do. Sure. So first I would either get some sterile gauze from the clinic or from the local drugstore, like four by four gauze, get a pack or Amazon. But if that happens, make sure you have some gloves. They don't have to be sterile, but some clean gloves, some medical tape, like a roll of small paper tape, medical paper tape. And if that catheter becomes wet, remove that old dressing, use a clean sterile gauze to pat it dry. Okay. Okay, with your gloves on. Well, make sure you wash your hands before you put the gloves on. But say. pat it dry and then put a new dressing over it. Okay. And tape it down until you go to your next uh treatment where the staff normally here in the US they change that every treatment, the dressing. They clean it and change it. Yes. And so do it, you know, you got something to hold you until you go to treatment. Then once you get there, just let them know what you've done. And they would, you know, change it by their protocol and procedure and, and go from there. But I would, if I was a patient with a catheter, I would definitely keep extra supplies at home if that happens. Just like if you had a, a graft, AV graft or fistula. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you have gauze and gloves at home because some patients, when they start bleeding at, at, at dialysis, when they get home and they take the tape and bandages off, they may start bleeding again. Yeah. I've known patients who uh, started bleeding at home again and actually passed away uh, yeah. because they bled out in their sleep. Yeah. Okay. Well, here we get given everything. So you have everything at home delivered to the house, gauze. Um, the iodine you use to clean the area, the um, the uh, sterile sterile water, all of those is provided. So we don't really have to go out to go buy anything. Everything is in the house, and I think you know a, a lot of people um, are aware of that because that's one of the information that patients are, are, are given. Um, I just wanted there's something that occurred to me which has just slipped uh, from my head. It's something about wet and dry, but I can't remember exactly what it is, but I will come back to that when I remember. Um, so um, I think um, the next question is, after somebody um, has been diagnosed as having acute kidney injury, um, how can people avoid deteriorating to a dialysis stage? So that's deteriorating to when the, um, to CKD. How can they do that? Because some people, can, because as you know, the kidney can take a lot of abuse up to 2% of function. So, but how can people avoid getting to that extent where they would need dialysis? Because I know that AKI can be reversed. Can you just tell the people who are listening right now? Well, just from my experience, because yeah. that's the only thing I can speak from, and I'm not let people know I'm not a, a medical doctor, but yeah. with AKI, it depends on what caused the AKI. Okay. I've seen people who had AKI, depending on what caused it, started dialysis, got, you know, and then the kidneys function started back, and then years later, started back dialysis again. So, I mean, for instance, say if one has lupus, okay? You got nephritis lupus. Say somebody has an episode where it attacked their kidneys and they had to do maybe one or two treatments, yeah. you know, of dialysis if it got that far. And, you know, the kidneys may have shut down and then they do dialysis and the numbers started getting yeah. better yeah. and the person came off dialysis for a while and they was able to manage their lupus and that condition with steroids 
until they got to the point where the kidneys couldn't function anymore. So it, it, it depends. So let's say I knew a gentleman back in the 80s. Yeah. OK, that when I was a technician, I worked in a hospital yeah. as a as a cute technician. Yeah. So this gentleman came in that they found on the floor from a heroin overdose. He was at a hotel and it shut his kidneys down. OK, now he did treatment every day. And then when I started, maybe about two to three weeks later, when I come in the room, I start seeing urine in the Foley bag. And then each day, it was more and more. Okay. So the kidneys were coming back. So if somebody, if it was the case for someone like that, I would say, don't use heroin no more. You know, live, live a, a healthy, balanced life as much as you can, as I showed on the PowerPoint with taking your medicines that the doctor put you on, uh, drink plenty of water, exercise, watching your diet, uh, watching your sodium, cholesterol, all that stuff. So you already damaged your kidneys. You don't know how bad they are. I mean, only thing you can tell is through a test. But if your kidneys come back to working yeah. after something like that, you want to do everything you can to protect it. And again, some conditions can cause an acute situation and you know, you'll overcome it. And then there's really nothing you can do if you got that condition. If you, if you don't, you know, the condition that caused the kidney failure. Yeah. Let's say some, someone could be in a car accident and, you know, have a tremendous shock to the kidneys from that. I know someone who uh, did cocaine and went out jogging in 90 degree weather and had a stroke and it shut their kidneys down temporarily. Yeah. So it just depends on the situation that causes that. And if you could avoid or reduce whatever caused Cost the actual acute kidney injury, yeah, you know, that's what I would suggest in focusing on. Okay, thank you. Uh, just the last question, that's the one I actually, that actually stick my mind was, um, you know, we talk about um, dry weight and wet weight before dialysis. So can you explain dry weight and wet weight and when people can recognize that? Because that's what people don't know. That is why they go, they drink too much and then they have problems with breathing and, you know, um, they become swollen. So can you just touch on that, please? Before Sure, we... sure. So your, your dry weight, base weight, whatever you want to call it here in the U.S., we call it dry weight, target weight, base weight. That weight is your weight without any fluid on. So let's just, just for the sake of argument, use an example. If you weigh 100 pounds without yeah. any fluid on, that would be your dry weight. Okay. Okay. Now, if someone comes in dialysis, their dry weight is 100, and they come in at 103, okay, they didn't gain three liters. Yeah. Depending on well, the game would be depending on what they left out the last dialysis and what they came in on this dialysis would be the game. But say if you start dialysis and the doctor said we're gonna set your dry weight at a hundred, you weigh on the scale and it's 104. Well, we're gonna try to remove four liters to get you down to that dry weight of a hundred. That doesn't always work, okay? That's an okay. estimated, it's estimated dry weight or target weight. It, it can move up, it can move down based on uh, your eating patterns. If you eating three, four meals a day, you're gonna naturally gain muscle weight. If you're not eating, you're in the hospital, you wanna lose weight, okay? Yeah. So if you come in at 100 and you're 104, I mean, if you're, Dry weight is 100 and you come in at 104, yeah. we're going to try to remove four liters. Sometimes that's that's not uh, possible to do because the patient may start cramping. So if someone 
has had a healthy appetite and their base weight is 100, then 100, and they come in a day at 104, right? And we try to take off four liters and they start cramping mm-hmm. and we got to get flu and then they go get their weight and they say 101 yeah, or 101.5. Yeah. We want to look at that or look back to see what they left out at. And if they left them leaving out at 101, 101 something, then that tells us then this is probably their new weight because yeah. they've gained weight if they've been eating good and, and feeling good, yeah. then they gain weight. Okay. So when we say somebody's wet, it means they have a lot of fluid on. Okay. So, I, I mean, and then you can go the other side. If somebody dry weight is 100 and they've been in a hospital. Yeah. And they've been in a hospital for like a week. Mm-hmm. And then they come out, they come back to the clinic. Their dry weight or their weight may be lower than a hundred. Yeah, it may be ninety-seven pounds now. Now we got to readjust that base weight because now they come in instead of coming in at one hundred and one. After they've been in the hospital, they may come in at ninety-seven five or ninety-eight because yeah. they lost that weight by being in the hospital. So now we got to re evaluate the dry weight. So n- now the dry weight used to be a hundred. Yeah. They went in the hospital and they came back. And their weight is 97 pounds. Now we got to readjust the weight to 97 or 97.5 or whatever it is. Yeah. So that's, that's how that works. It, but again, that fluctuates. And when someone first starts dialysis, you're not going to know what a dry weight is because they've been sick. They they got extra fluid on, depending yeah. on how long they had the disease. Yeah. Uh, you know, they still may have edema in the legs and fluid yeah. on. So we got to keep the doctor may say, okay, let's take, oh, we took off four liters in the hospital, try yeah. to remove three now. So we keep removing fluid until it gets to a point where the patient may start cramping. Yes. Or uh you know, the blood pressure. So that's how we kind of start figuring out what what the dry weight is when they don't have one. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope that explained it. I mean, well, it's really well, more entailed than that because especially with the hospital piece, if someone comes out, they used to be one weight and they went into the hospital for several days, yeah. they're going to come out less than the weight that they went in at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, you know, uh, it has been a, a really um, great um, session. Sure. So, I said thank you very much. It has oh, been no, a- I heard you. <laughs> I, I said sure. And Hilaria, if I may add, if anybody, you had mentioned about YouTube, if anybody want to see any of the educational uh, videos I've done on YouTube, uh, go to Steve the Kidney Nurse and like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, so um, so thank you everybody, um, you know, for, for coming this evening. Uh, and thank you to Steve. We are at the end of the session and I wish it didn't have to end because I've learned so much today. So I want to thank Steve for taking the time to speak to us about understanding dialysis for new patients, although it's mostly related to uh, the, the US, it's been really informative. I hope everyone took something away from this today. I cannot finish without thanking all of you, our audience who have been coming in and out to, to listen and uh, also to um, improve on the, your information. You've been amazing wanting to know more. Kidney disease is a killer disease, and when people are newly diagnosed, it can be scary. And going through dialysis is equally the same. It happened to me too. However, there is another way of avoiding going on dialysis, as Steve alluded to earlier. It is not a cure, but just the same treatment, and it's called organ donation. As a community, we do not uh, consider organ donation. But now is the time to think about it. 
I will encourage you to sign up to the organ donation register here in the UK. And that is on the, the website of the NHS Blood and Transplant. That's www.organdonation.nhs.uk and sign up or wherever you are in the world, whether in the US, Germany, you know, Europe, wherever, and have a conversation with your family and let them know your wish and leave them certain. So thank you very much for coming out today. And I hope you've enjoyed um, this session and um, we will see you next month um, in another, in our other series um, and with another professional just like Steve to come and speak about uh, a particular issue that um, you know our community has told us that they're interested to um, hear about or to gain more knowledge on. Thank you very much, Steve. I, I don't know if you have any last words for our audience. Again, I'd just like to thank WSH and BME Kidney Network for uh, allowing me to do this uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in today and watch. And please uh, be an advocate for your own health. Yes. That, that's correct. Be an advocate for your own health, because if you don't speak for yourself, if you don't stand up for yourself, nobody else can. I can see a chat has come up, come up and uh, Cindy says, thank you so much, Steve. This session was truly helpful. Thank you for taking out time to, spare, uh, to share your knowledge with us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. That is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And bye bye and see you again next month. Thank you, Steve. See y'all.